Hello, my name is Michiel Vremo and I will show you some examples of environmental energy sources you can use in your design concepts. In this lecture we will look at three sources of heat and cold, air, surface water and the underground. Each of these sources has a working mass and a temperature and we can use them to either draw heat or release it into the medium for cooling. The temperature of most of these sources is low, so usually you will need a heat pump to upgrade the heat or cold for part of the year. Most of these sources fluctuate both diurnally and seasonally. That means that they will be a lot more effective if you can store the energy that you need, either heat or cold, for use in the off period. Sabine has previously explained storage principles. A heat exchanger, as Eric explained, helps transfer the e energy to or from the source medium. If we need a higher or lower temperature than the source and heat exchanger can provide, we also need a heat pump. A quick recap. A heat pump can move heat from one place to another by using electricity or gas and in the process increases the output temperature to something we can use. We will now move on to the sources. Air will be the most familiar environmental source of energy, especially for cooling. In a previous lecture you've learned about air conditioning or AC units. These are also known as air sourced heat pumps because they use the outside air as a heat sink. They can also be used in reverse to heat up your building. Compared to the other sources, air sourced heat pumps are, however, the noisiest and least efficient. They will use a lot more electricity for the same amount of heat or cold and are therefore more expensive when used. Fortunately, AC units are not always necessary. Free cooling can also be used. This uses ventilators, wind pressure or thermal draft requiring only a small amount of electricity or in case of passive systems, none at all. A famous vernacular example is the wind catcher, which has been used in the Middle East for thousands of years. Because it has shafts in all directions, air is, some, is always pushed in from one direction and drawn out on the opposing side, removing some of the heat from inside the building. This wind cowl is a modern example, used in the bed Z housing development in the UK. It automatically rotates with the wind. Night ventilation cools down the building at night so it can absorb more heat during the day. This example shows the effect of just using night ventilation. In this example, the mass of the building has cooled down so much that it takes several hours for the indoor temperature to catch up. Night ventilation does require building mass, so it will not work very well with light structures. The second source I'll be showing is surface water. Lakes, rivers and the sea can all be used for heating or cooling. An example that combines several technologies is the Rotterdam building, which uses the Maas River for cooling. Here, river water is pumped through the cooling plant in the building and either used with just a heat exchanger or, if needed, cooled down further with a heat pump. The same principle can be used for heating, for example with seawater, which is relatively warm in winter. However, a heat pump is then necessary. For lakes, rivers and seas, water temperature fluctuates in summer and winter, so combining these with seasonal thermal storage makes them a lot more useful. The last source is below us, the underground. In Eric's lecture you saw ground duct ventilation. This is a simple example of using the soil for preconditioning ventilation air. There are however other systems that can use the underground. Although volcanic regions like Iceland are famous for using their volcanic heat, it can and is being used in many other places in the world if the ground is suitable. For buildings, shallow and deep geothermal heat are used. These systems are very similar technically to some of the storage systems from Sabine's lecture, except they only draw energy from the underground. Ground source heat pump systems use the top layers of soil. There are two types of systems. Horizontal ground source heat pumps use a network of pipes close to the surface, one to two meters, and although they are therefore relatively easy to build, they are also more subject to seasonal changes. Vertical ground source heat pumps use one or more drilled shafts that go much deeper, up to 100 meters. This means that a small surface footprint can deliver much more energy than a horizontal ground source heat pump, 
but drilling instead of digging is more expensive. Finally, there are deep geothermal systems. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. The average temperature goes up with th about 3 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters of depth. To get high temperatures, the well will therefore have to be very deep. 500 meters to 2 kilometers is common, and for industrial sources, 5 to 7 kilometers is being explored. The presence of an aquifer at depth makes it a lot easier to extract this heat. This is the system shown here. Because of the need for deep drilling, deep geothermal systems are generally very expensive and therefore only suitable for very large buildings, neighborhoods and districts. This example is used for a horticulture complex in the Netherlands. So, to recap, the air, surface water and ground around and under your building can be used for heating and cooling using heat exchangers. Because source temperatures are low and fluctuate daily and seasonally, they are sometimes paired with a heat pump and thermal storage. In this lecture, we've seen air-sourced heat pumps, also known as air conditioning, wind catchers, night ventilation, surface water, ground ducts, ground-sourced heat pumps, both horizontal and vertical, and deep geothermal wells. As you can see, there are a lot of possibilities, but they all depend on the local environmental circumstances. So, find projects that use these sources in the same region as your building design to see what you can do. Thank you for your attention.